Hi there, I'm Matthew Sheffield. This is Theory of Change. Thanks for being here. We've got another great program for you today, but I wanted to, before we get into that, uh, just give a little bit of background. So we're part of the Flux Media Network. So go to flux.community for more articles and podcasts about politics, religion, media, and technology. And if you like what we're doing, you can go to patreon.com slash discover flux to support our work on there. And then if you want to, uh, if you're on Substack uh, as a reader or, or whatever, um, you can also go to theoryofchange.show and you can subscribe to the show on there. So I do really appreciate everybody who is supporting the show. Uh, you're making it possible. Uh, we're not bankrolled by any nonprofits or by any universities or, and, and certainly not by George Soros. So uh, we can always use your help to get the word out and to expand the show, to take it to more and more people and to bring you these deep conversations about uh, the topics that we cover on the show. And uh, if you go to theoryofchange.show, you can also get all of the episodes with video and audio. And if you have a subscriber membership, get uh, full access to all of the episodes, including the transcripts as well. So I encourage everybody to do that. And thank you very much for those who are already doing so. All right. So with that out of the way, uh, let's get into today's program. As anyone who pays attention to the news would know, American politics is becoming increasingly radicalized as domestic extremism of the far right variety has skyrocketed in recent years. But this escalation is actually the symptom of an even bigger problem, that our two major political parties have been stuck in a trench warfare system for decades. It's been nearly 40 years since a presidential candidate won more than 55% of the national popular vote. It's been 51 years since someone had more than 60%. In all this time, neither party has been able to create a mass movement for their ideas. Republicans haven't done so because they've openly embraced a minoritarian political strategy based on winning rural states with lots of religious white people. But Democrats haven't built a movement for progressive ideas either. And that's a critical mistake for people who ostensibly want to protect democracy. So why have Democrats lost interest in mass movements and large coalitions? It's a very important question, and one that my guest on today's show, Timothy Schenck, attempts to answer in his new book, Realigners, Partisan Hacks, Political Visionaries, and the Struggle to Rule American Democracy. Thanks for being here today, Tim. Uh, thanks so much for having me. All right. So your uh, book is very, very uh, discursive with lots of different people in it. Let's um, describe, t tell us, tell the audience, first of all, what what would you describe your book as in like a sentence or two first? Yeah. And then we'll so it's a biography of American democracy that I try to tell through the rise and fall of the making of the country's dominant electoral coalitions. And this is a story that really goes back to the drafting of the Constitution. So that's where the book begins and runs, in my case, all the way down to the storming of the Capitol in 2021. Okay. okay. Um, and then, uh, so with, you would say a biography of democracy, but it's, it's using, uh, it's not just focusing on one person or one character, it's focusing on a lot of characters. And, exactly. And, and there are all sorts of different ways you could tell the story of American democracy. You could, for instance, focus on activists who are pushing for the most expansive conception of what the government could deliver. Or you could just tell it as a story about the extension of suffrage rights of more people voting and how that takes place. But in my case, I want to shift the focus to both the parties and in a lot of cases, specific individuals who have visions for building majority coalitions and then against all sorts of odds, succeed in building a majority that at the national level that is strong enough to, in some cases, push through transformative changes in American life. Mm -hmm. And as you, as you note in the conclusion, um, most of the people that you profile in the book do not really succeed um, in their efforts. And, and we'll get into that um, as we go on in the episode here. But I mean, I think essentially probably the number one takeaway that I had from the book was that change is hard as, as the saying goes. Um, and you know, you, you just go through and chronicle it over, over hundreds of years. 
um, throughout uh, different activists and different politicians and as they emerge political uh, consultants as well. Um, so let's maybe get started uh, with the, uh, I think as you note correctly that the biggest change in American history was the abolition of slavery and the integration of people who were formerly subject to a totalitarian system of governance in which they had no power whatsoever, that that's the biggest change in American history. But, you know, it's it's something, as you note, that really began in the beginning um, of the country. And, and you focus a lot on that um, with with the Constitution and uh and how that how the role of slavery in there in in forming it. So uh, maybe talk talk a little bit about that um, you know, the role of slavery um, within the constitutional uh, convention and the colonial area. Absolutely. So it's an essential divide that you can see right from the beginning of the country's history, as in in Philadelphia in 1787, when the delegates are arguing over what the shape of the new government can, should be, James Madison points out that the divide that keeps asserting itself again and again and again is between the free states and the slave states. But the extraordinary change that takes place in American history between that small cloistered room in Philadelphia in 1787, where literally the windows are nailed shut to prevent any word of the conversations that are taking place inside from reaching the outside world, well, that's where you begin in 1787, where, oh my gosh, you get these people together and they're arguing about slavery. By 1860, you'll be in a world of mass democratic politics where, yes, it is a suffrage that is still, the right to vote is still severely restricted by contemporary perspectives. It is overwhelmingly for white men. And yet, at the time, you have a pervasive conversation about the place of slavery in the United States that seems to be drawing in the entire country so that in 1860, more than 80 percent of eligible voters turn out to show up at the polls for an election where everyone knows the key issue is whether slavery will be a continue to remain an essential part of the United States, or as Abraham Lincoln put it, be put on the road to ultimate extinction. And so that transformation from an issue that's dividing a narrow political elite to one that runs through the country at large is in a sense the defining story of American politics in the first century of the country's existence. And of course, one whose legacy we're still living with today. Yes, definitely. And um, it's it's notable also, you know, when you are going through some of the history um, that um, a, as the uh, the Constitution was, you know, being debated, um, that there there was a lot of skepticism toward it. But um, I guess before we get there, maybe let's go to the idea that um, of the Articles of Confederation. Like, what was the what was the problem with that, and why did people want to want to get rid of that? Um, so lots of different problems from lots of different perspectives. The group that I zoom in on and really that the book focuses on, uh, there. if you're telling the story of American democracy, there are just many, many, many different ways you could focus on it, obviously. So the question is, who do you choose? Who do you pay attention to? The book is called Real Liners because I decided that the way to make a potentially enormous subject manageable was to focus on the tiny group of people who are in charge of crafting a given party's message at a given time. So it's necessarily a focus on a pretty elite group. And this, again, this begins with the Constitution, where the people I'm studying are the ones who are drafting the Constitution itself. And their concerns with the government, well, there are a few. One is that it's just not powerful enough to impose order, either order at home in the sense that they would prefer it, and also to make the United States a major presence on the global stage. So they're worried that you have all these riot, these protests, this discontent, this upheaval manifesting itself, for instance, in mobs rioting against uh, tax collection. And they're worried that there is a sort of disorder that's creeping into American life that will lead to chaos, which they fear, not just because this is a group that's disproportionately wealthy and would like to hold on to its stuff, thank you very much, but also some of them have dreams of a grand American empire. And unless you have a sort of coherent national state that can impose order at home, then you're never gonna get a strong American presence abroad. And even if you don't have people saying, aha, we want to take over the world today, there is a sense that in a world of hostile empires, the United States needs to be able to stand up against France, against England. And so for this Republican, small r Republican experiment to survive, there's a sense that the grownups need to be put in charge, that things have gone off the rails with the country and that in order to restore stability at home, you need to have a national political elite 
at the helm of a government strong enough to bring the discontent to heal, but that is also, this gets to an important point for the book, able to claim that it speaks for the will of the people as a whole, because that turns out to be a really crucial source of legitimacy and therefore of authority for a government when you can no longer say, oh, why is the system the way it is? Because I'm a king and God told me that this is how it's gonna be, right? You need a replacement for this old idea of the divine right of kings. What happens? Divine right of the people in a sense steps in in its place. Yeah, well, and one of the things that you note is that, um, you know, a lot of the American, uh, the most influential uh, framers of the Constitution, they were concerned about democracy, and and you're you, you're you're one of the few people that I've seen in a, in a discussion of American history who's noted correctly that, you know, while uh, the the framers of the Constitution drew heavily on the the Greco Roman traditions, uh, they explicitly were against the most democratic. Um, Athenian tradition, which was that offices were not decided, most offices were not decided by voting, they were decided by lots. Um, and that people who, because the, otherwise it would, it was, that was the best way to make everyone have an equal chance of winning. And that was why the Athenians did that. Whereas the American founders said that elections uh, they didn't see elections that way. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so there's this older notion of democracy that at the time is associated with Athens, or sort of classical Athens as the sort of quintessential instance. And the idea there is that democracy really means equality of power. And you're right, it's symbolized by the idea that the sort of responsibility for government decisions will be, for holding government post, will just be determined by lottery. It'll just be pure luck. And the notion that a James Madison, for example, has is that we can have, in a sense, a new type of democracy where the goal isn't to abolish those hierarchies, but rather to legitimize them. And the way that we'll be able to legitimize this hierarchy is by having a governing class, what some described as a natural aristocracy, who will be able to say, we got this role not because we seized it, not because we inherited it, not because we forced it on anyone, but because the public at large provided its consent. So that in a sense, this new governing elite will trace its authority entirely from the consent of the governed. And that's almost something that's so obvious, we take it for granted today, but it is a historic shift. And I think that more than anything else in our constitution, more than checks and balances, more than anything you learn in uh, social studies when you're in middle school, that this ability to say, we are government that derives this authority ultimately from the people, that counts for the longevity of the system. That's why we have a government today that more or less resembles the sort of original blueprint drawn up more than two centuries ago. Yeah, and I mean, as a just as a you know uh, historical man, I mean, the United States Constitution is the the oldest uh, representative democracy uh, constitution in the world, and um, so it it does suggest that there was. You know, stability was the number one goal, um, and they achieved that to some degree, mm -hmm. um, including by deliberately making taking action harder um, than it would be. And um, and that I think I think we're we're up against that in the present day, but uh, I don't want to get ahead of us. Uh, yeah, and I will say too. So one good thing to keep in mind is for anyone who wants to change the world, that you and I share, share we we share this perspective that it can be easy to assume if we just let the people speak that the sort of world will sort itself out accordingly. And a great, just surprising moment for me when I was researching the book was discovering that James Madison in 1787 in Philadelphia, he was totally open to the idea of having a popular vote determine who gets to be president of the United States. You know, you think about this as like a progressive demand today. It's like, oh yeah, abolish the electoral college, do away with the work of the founders. Well, Madison, who more than any other single person is responsible for the constitution as we know it today, thinks that's totally acceptable in 1787. Doesn't get his way, ultimately, this goes back to slavery, because because in a system where you have an electoral college and a three -fifth, and the three fifths compromise, then having this sort of state level decision gives slave states a boost that gives them more power than direct popular vote would. But the reason why Madison, of course, himself a slave owner, the reason why he's comfortable with the popular vote is he says that, yeah, we'll open the presidency up to a popular vote, but it's not going to go to just anyone. The idea was that the wider the potential electorate, the more likely that the public at large would just defer to whoever the natural aristocracy chose for them, that sort of the system would sort itself out so that the finest would not inevitably, but more or less routinely rise to the top. So starting with the realization that a sort of 
total agenda of democratization of a type that I do support today. I want to get rid of the Electoral College. I'd love to abolish the filibuster. You know, that is a useful move for all sorts of reasons. But until we reckon with the insight of James Madison that democracy, as we understand it today, by itself is not inherently radical or even reformist, then we're not going to get anywhere. Yeah. Well, and to that point, um, you, you quote a, an anonymous uh, American who was uh, apparently writing to somebody in 1976, uh, sorry, 1776. And uh, this person, it was seems to have been a uh, somebody who was concerned about about the future state of American politics. But at the time, basically, here's what they wrote. They said, quote, the rich, having been used to govern, think it is their right. And the poor commonality, having hitherto little or no hand in government, seem to think it does not belong to them to have any. And that, you know, to me really does, is a great example of, of what Madison was saying that, you know, you can have a national electorate, but I mean, just as a matter of, as we've seen in, the, in, in contemporary elections that, you know, you need massive amounts of money in order to carry your message out to the public. Uh, so you're going to need a lot of money. And then a lot of people, they don't feel like that they can, that they're really entitled to something better. I mean, that's something that is that some of the people in, that you just talk about in the book uh, run up against that problem over and over again. Um, did you have any thoughts on that or, or we can? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> other than that, this is the defining like struggle for American reformers from 1776 down to the present. I think that's absolutely right. And it's the start, I think, of any serious attempt to reckon with both just how American democracy works, which as a historian I care about, but I'm co-editor of Dissent. I'm very proud to be associated with the longest running democratic socialist journal in the United States. It's something that my, my, those of us on the left, we, I think that we also have to take seriously when formulating our own politics. And there can sometimes be a notion that all you have to do is say the right things, i.e. the stuff that you already believe, and that the coalition would only form itself around you if not for the obstruction of people who are willfully standing in your way. But reckoning with all of the obstacles in between the world as we would like it to be in the world that we live now and realizing that Solinsky has this line that there are two types of power in the world. There's organized money and there's organized people. Think that on the left, you can pretty much trust on organized money not being there for you in a serious way. So organized people, to my mind, this is our best shot. Doesn't mean it's a guarantee, but of the present options available, the best one that we have. But that means that taking very, very seriously the question of how to mobilize as much of the people as you can on your own side, that has to be the beginning of something. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and to to that to that end, you know, when when with some of the people that you talk about in the book, um, they, you know, the ones who succeeded at getting the changes that they wanted, at least you know to some degree or another, they did it by getting people to agree with them who didn't necessarily have the same motivations. Um, and I think uh, the, the great. Uh, the first time where this really happened in, in a democratic sense, as close as it could be in the in the early, you know, highly restricted franchise of the United States was, you know, with the, the rise of, of Andrew Jackson, um, somebody who was not, you know, didn't have a lot of, uh, you know, hadn't come up through the political system in a traditional sense. Uh, but he, he understood, a, he, he understood that uh, how to use you know, how to speak to the public in a way that was able to get them support, get him support. And one of them was his, his, one of his key phrases was this idea of the money power. Mm -hmm. um, you could talk about Andrew Jackson a little bit in, in this context, if you could. Please. I mean, Jackson's fascinating because he's both sort of the representative of the birth of a kind of populist strain in American politics, the outsider taking on a corrupt elite at the same time that he rise into the power on the back of what becomes the first really organized mass political party in American history, what we know today as the Democratic Party, but at the time was called the democracy. And it's this fusion of outsider populist, a sort of outsider populist soul with like the body and the machine of a emerging political establishment, a political machine, that's really what allows him to ride into Washington against the sincere opposition of an older political establishment that just a few years earlier thought that it would be control of the city and the nation for the foreseeable future. And 
with Jackson, you see what emerges over time. So he takes office in um, 1828, 1829 as the voice of a kind of just national sentiment against this elite, but that by 1832, when he's running for re-election, he zoomed in on an enemy, and this is called the money power. And it stands in for a sense that this rich New York financial elite has not is not just running the economy, but that it's reaching its tentacles into our democracy that we're that we ordinary Americans, by which of course he means essentially an audience targeted at sort of like the white property owning men of the United States, importantly, not just in the South, but in the North as well, that this tiny cabal is taking power away from you. And the only way that you can grab it back is through politicians representing you through the democracy. Yeah, and the uh, the other thing about it was that you know what what the audience individually thought was the money power, it was different um, depending on on where they were or what their situations were, and it didn't matter to him, you know who who what they thought it was. What it mattered was that they were going to support him. Yeah, every politician at a major level ends up being a kind of Rorschach test. And also this like blank screen onto which you project your own hopes, your own fears, your own desires. And especially in a country as like broad and diverse as the United States in this early period where you don't have a national media in a real way to make sure that you're following a consistent line on everything, there's a kind of useful ambiguity that can set in. And this will become increasingly true for Democrats when they emerge as a party with strong um, roots in both the North and the South, where by the 1850s, when they're running candidates for the president, you would get the sense almost that one person is a anti-slavery critic in the North and a defender of the South's peculiar institution when you go below the Mason-Dixon line. And one of the great triumphs of the early Republican Party, which emerges as an at its core anti-slavery party, is to make that kind of hemming and hawing and going back and forth on slavery impossible. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, and, and I guess what's kind of interesting, you know, for, for, for Jackson is, I, you know, it's hard to say that there was necessarily an ideology behind what he was doing. It was, it wasn't really ideological. And so in that sense, it's kind of, I think it's there's a certain amount of uh, poetry in that he basically created this idea of campaigning and building a popular uh, support, but he actually didn't have an ideology that he was pushing. <laughs> Yeah, and this is something that you'll find whenever you pay attention to politicians is that there can be a kind of pragmatic brilliance, like you see the genius in how they act, not necessarily in how they speak. And of course, when it comes to politics, sometimes having a coherent ideology, can, especially if it's the wrong one, can be a major hindrance because it prevents you from seeing how things are changing. And one reason why so many of the lives that I study in the book end in ways that are often disappointing to the people who they, you, know, you might succeed for a while, you might win one election, uh, but that doesn't guarantee you a permanent hold on power is because the same lessons, the same worldview that can be a very useful tool in one set of circumstances, well, conditions change. And if you don't evolve with them, then you're gonna be left behind by history. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, and um, and I guess, uh, and, we'll, and we'll get into that further, but I guess one of the other, um, aspects that that is true is, you know, in this, the, the perpetual struggle to end slavery. So it was something that a lot of people from the very beginning wanted um, in the United States. Um, and it was something that as a, I mean, if so, I guess maybe let's, let's start before the constitution um, in, in, in terms of why some people felt like that it should be abolished. Um, and then what did they uh, end up, what was the, what was the, what was the, I mean, you talked about the three-fifths compromise, but maybe talk about it in the constitutional framework of how this idea is sort of promulgated below the surface uh, for a long time. Yeah. And the core of the opposition really springs. You see it mobilizing in the 1770s from the idea that it's very hard in a country supposedly founded on the notion that all men are created equal to justify slavery. Of course, there are folks who do it, including Thomas Jefferson, but you see by the 1770s, 1780s, the beginning of a anti-slavery movement in the United States. That is real, that is quite significant by historical standards. A break from a norm where throughout human history, slavery have been treated as a maybe unfortunate, but more or less inevitable fact of the human condition. Now, 
I having noted that sort of the emergence of this anti-slavery campaign in the 1780s, 1770s, that's really, really significant. But the fact is that going into the 1850s, anti-slavery politics is distinctly marginal in Washington, in Washington and in the sort of American national system writ large, so that you have not just Democrats, but the chief opposition party, the Whigs, both of them are North-South coalitions that depend for their existence on pushing the debate of, about slavery to the margins of the national conversation. And so the extraordinary transformation that takes place over that decade of the 1850s, in a sense, is that you take the populist spirit and the institutional innovations of the Jacksonian period, including the making of a mobilized mass political machine, and turn that into, instead of using all its energy to prevent people from talking about slavery, using it to focus energy on that conversation and taking it from the margins to the center. And when you do it, it turns out to be explosive enough to lead the country into a civil war that basically nobody saw coming in 1860. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the way that they did it basically was that, um, you know, as you noted that, you know, the, the moral argument, it was not something that people really, most people, most, you know, white, uh, Americans were particularly interested in. They didn't really want to have that discussion. Um, and whether that's, you know, I, I, I'd say it's probably more that they, most people don't like having philosophical discussions about anything. Uh, and so as a, just as a campaign tactic, it was a failure in that regard, trying to say people, because as, as you know, you know, a lot of people thought they said, yeah, slavery is wrong. It's immoral, but you know, what are you going to do about it? Uh, that was basically it was where things stood and, and what the innovations were. And, and you talk about several people who were involved with that um, in the book, Frederick Douglass and Charles Sumner, um, trying to reorient to not just say the moral argument against it, but also other arguments as to why slavery should be. Um, yeah. And the really them. profound transition that they make, you can almost capture it by saying that Repub where Jacksonian Democrats said that the money power was the enemy, the money power is the thing that you ordinary Americans is standing in the way of like the country that you want and the country as it is today that's threatening everything that you care about. Republicans will say, no, no, it's not the money power in the same way. It's the slave power. And there will be some people who say, oh, oh the money power and the, and the slave power, they're the same thing. That you have, kind of, in a sense, Wall Street and the sort of planter class are clasping hands and uniting against ordinary Americans. But more broadly, it's a sense that the slave power is serving the interests of this narrow plantation elite in the South and that it is endangering the country. It's taking your government away from you and in very material ways, standing in your own, the path of your own self-interest. So for example, this comes across most clearly in the battle over Western territories, where by the 1850s, there's a sense in both the North and the South that if those regions are gonna keep their model alive, if you're gonna have a country of small-time farmers, essentially, and small-time businesses in the North versus a slave society in the South, both of them think that they have to expand in order to continue existing. And so it forces a choice. No longer can you say, oh, if you're in the North, listen, you might oppose slavery, but it doesn't affect, affect you in any real way. So you can object to it, but you'll hold your tongue because you care about something else. No, your own self-interest is now brought into the battle over the future of slavery. And when combined with a moral critique that is real and that does have power, that fusion of self-interest and moral vision turns out to be enormously powerful. Yeah, it really was. And 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 the uh, part of that argument was to say that, you know, with building up the idea of the slave power is that, you know, if you as a as a farmer or a laborer or just some, you know, some non-rich person living in the north, um, you cannot advance in these new territories, new states, because these slaveholders are just going to move there and they have free labor people who will do all the work for them for nothing. And they're going to undercut you on price. They're going to take all the land and you'll have nothing. And, you know, it was, it was a persuasive argument to a lot of people. Exactly. This focus on the slave power is what turns slavery from somebody else's problem into your problem. And that is the quickest way to mobilize uh, people on your behalf is when you're pointing to something that in their lives right now, they want to change. Yeah. Well, now, was there resistance from some people at the idea of the development of the slave power idea? 
Oh, of course, especially from anyone who was doing quite well under the old political system. Thank you very much. There are people who say that it's a fringe conspiracy, that it's something. The funny thing is that there are some people who quite funny and tragic. They, they point out, you know, listen, if you really run an election over slavery, then this is the fastest route into civil war. This is something in the Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858. So Abraham Lincoln sort of a rising Republican politician at the time, we're against Stephen Douglas, who is the central, arguably the central Democrat of the period, even though he wasn't president. Douglas warns the voters of Illinois in 1858, if this guy gets his way, it's gonna tear the country apart. And Lincoln quite sincerely, I think says, no, what are you talking about? Like, yes, like we're gonna have a fight, but we can resolve this democratically. We're not gonna abolish slavery right away. We're gonna put it on the road to ultimate extinction. Maybe that takes decades. Maybe I won't see it in my lifetime, but this is a matter of principle that we can deal with peacefully within the normal rules of democratic politics. And Douglas is one who says, nope, playing with fire. If you put slavery on the agenda, we're gonna have a war about it. And if your side wins, guess what, Abe, who is saying at the time that after slavery is brought, after slavery is abolished, he is his preferred solution is colonization, which is essentially taking African-Americans who have only known living in the United States and saying, go somewhere else. Douglas is going to say, no, that's not realistic, that you either are going to have essentially a multiracial democracy or nothing. Like that is the choice. Either we keep the status quo or we embark on a change that could lead both to war and toward a fundamental transformation of American life. Turns out that for the consequences of what Lincoln was envisioning, Douglas was a much more reliable guy than Lincoln himself. So that in a sense, no one, at least in mainstream American politics, is quite, they're not ready to commit to the full project of what opposing the slave power entails, but the force of events drags them along anyway. Yeah, yeah. And well, and, and then of course, yeah, the Civil War does in fact break out just like Douglas predicts. And, um, you know, as a book of politics, you're, you rightfully don't focus on the military aspects of that uh, much. And so um, so that will take us to the, the Reconstruction era and um, you know, in Reconstruction, I, I, you, you're, you, you're, you're very right to note, you know, just as a, up until that period in world history, nothing that radical at that scale of a social upheaval uh, had ever been attempted in human history um, of that of that scale. Like there had been, of course, you know, uh, individual tribes or, you know, countries that had been enslaved, but, you know, these were small, you know, ethno states um, in the ancient world or, or things like that. And um, in, in, in the, uh, the, the conquest of, of, of colonization, you know, those typically tended, it was never all at once. It was, you know, a gradual, you know, move into area and kind of take it over um, over time. So nothing like that had been done at this scale. Um, and it, I, I feel like, do you think that that's something that is appreciated enough among historians? Historians, yes. I don't know mm -hmm. about sort of the public at large, but I, I say this, or my supervisor in graduate school, the single historian who's had more influence on me than anyone else is uh, Eric Foner, who is truly, truly um, one of the greats of the profession and whose single most important book is the best history of reconstruction that's come out in my bias view, I would say ever. And so I have from the very beginning, as in like literally my first history class in college, maybe this just reflects my own provincialism, but I have understood the both the, the radicalism and the centrality of, re of reconstruction in American history. And I think it would be hard to find a sort of credentialed American historian today who would disagree with that perspective. On the other hand, if you go into the wider public, because it's a messy, complicated, and ultimately tragic history that doesn't have the neat narrative resolution and the intrinsic drama of the Civil War, that it's you're, you're never gonna be able to compete with that in public consciousness. The story of Abraham Lincoln, the ending of slavery, this, in a sense, just beautiful culmination of so much of the best in the American political tradition, like that, that's extraordinary. And reconstruction just forces you in a way that I think is essential. But honestly, I feel like a little choked up talking about it now to see the sort of ideals that seem so close to realization in the 1860s, how quickly they lead to the just the world of the Gilded Age, robber barons and Jim Crow. It's it's brutal. And it's one that we have to reckon with as Americans. But I can understand why people would want to look away. Yeah, it's it's not a happy ending, basically. Um, and, and I people... would say that part of the problem is that Reconstruction forces us again to think about the tension between our commitment to sort of 
liberalism understood as a freedom and respect for difference and opening up rights to the large number of people with the tension between that and democracy. Because just the fact of the matter is that the sort of African-Americans were a major presence in the population and the electorate of the South, but they were not in the South as a whole a majority. So that most Southerners in 1860 did, most white Southerners did not own slaves. And those who did, there is a tiny, tiny number that own a significant number of slaves. This means that in a sense, the swing vote in the South, it's not former slaves who are quite clear that they want the rights that they deserve as fully as full American citizens. And it's not a planter class who would like nothing more than to go back to exactly the way the world was in 1860 as much as humanly possible. The swing vote are these mostly non-slaveholding, small-time farmer whites who have to decide for themselves what's in their self-interest. And I don't think that we should be shocked from like a small, from a lowercase d Democratic perspective, if they are not ready to leap into like a multiracial coalition in 1866. So that one consequence is that reconstruction governments are more or less imposed by force from the North on the South, that you get the ratification, for instance, of the 14th Amendment, guaranteeing birthright citizenship under the Constitution. That's not a choice that Southerners have. If they want to go back into the Union, ratification of the 14th Amendment is a precondition. So you have a sort of egalitarian project that is enforced not through not through democratic means but more or less at the barrel of a gun and that is part of a broader political culture of violence in the reconstruction reconstruction south one that's driven by a campaign of homegrown white domestic terrorism aimed at asserting racial supremacy yes but that is also confronting the fact that if you're looking for democratic legitimacy for the full bore Frederick Douglass, Charles Sumner project, it can be hard to find on the ground in much of the South. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, and I think the, the person who, um, you know, really bore kind of the, the emotional and psychological brunt of this personally, individually was W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, and, you know, it's, it's notable you know, with respect to, you know, the ideas of, of Karl Marx, you know, there there was no, uh, you know, like, obviously, they were nothing not relevant to the reconstruction um, in the United States, by and large. Um, but Du Bois, you know, the, the, the uh, civil, the early civil rights um, activist and thinker and philosopher, etc. Uh, you know, they, they really, I mean, you know, he's he's such a fascinating character, and I think really kind of, you know, the 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 person most that that I, that I thought you did a, a great job of highlighting, you know, his experience with all of that. When, for tell 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 the audience a little bit about his story here, and, and yeah, he's an overwhelming force like in American intellectual and political life. So he's born in the 1860s when Andrew Johnson is president, lives until 1963, actually dies the day before the March on Washington. In, um, in that year. So almost from Andrew Johnson to Lyndon Johnson, just uh, like a remarkable trajectory during which time he writes like, literally dozens of books, plays, like run down the list. He has in a sense as full a life of the mind as you could possibly imagine in a way that makes me able to say a dopey phrase like life of the mind with actual sincerity because it's W.B. Du Bois that we're talking about, becomes the first African-American to receive a PhD from Harvard, uh, just it touches on everything from history, sociology, politics, run down the list of things that you could discuss. To me, why he figures as a major subject in the book is that one of the subjects that Du Bois came to time and again during this very long life filled with a lot of insightful work was how American democracy functions. Literally as a teenager, when he's writing these sort of stringer part-time articles for an African-American newspaper that's explaining local politics in the, so in the South, sorry, in the North, down to thinking about the possibilities that the March on Washington might open up. This question of democracy, how to realize what he sees as the sort of promise of American ideals while grappling with just the reality of American life. This is one of the central questions of his intellectual work. And as someone who for much of his lifetime is one of the, like, the leading figures in African-American life, and by his own lights, almost kind of the self-appointed chief political strategist for Black America. It's a question that it's someone who the intellectual in him is drawn to these debates about the nature of, nature of democracy. 
and then the pragmatist in him who is concerned more than anything else with advancing the conditions of African Americans and the age of Jim Crow is just aware of the political requirements. He comes comes to that time and again. So of course the story of Du Bois has been told many times before, but what I got to do with the book was tell it through the lens of, or tell it with the center of this question of democracy, both as an abstract ideal and a pressing political question, which, yeah, just because Du Bois is an extraordinary thinker, it can make for an extraordinary tale. Yeah, and at varying points during his life, you know, he, he, he changes his position uh, over and over, like, well, you know, thinking that large scale change and civil rights um, can happen and will happen. And then, you know, coming to realize, no, it's not going to happen. And then, you know, a few years later, something else, another development comes and he, he gets more faith. And, and, and I mean, that's, he, he just has the cyclical, um, it's, a, it's almost like, you know, he personally experiences these larger themes that you, you know, that you're focusing on with all these other characters, you know, individual lives. He lived for so long that he experienced these directly himself. And I think that anyone who invests in politics, we've gone through our own version of that cycle where there are times when it's really easy to believe that change is coming and there are times when it seems impossible. And he just had the advantage exactly of living for a very long time and being able to explain those reasons so eloquently. But he also had just this, the, just the fact that you are a brilliant person confronted with what at the time it was fair to think of as an intractable problem. So what do you do? And he came up with all sorts of different strategies for beating it. And some of which ended up being profoundly influential for among other things, the civil rights revolution that did so much to destroy the system that he spent his life campaigning against. But on the other hand, we all know that the realization of formal legal equality in the 1960s, as enormous an accomplishment as that was, did not translate to a material transformation for too many people. So that we are still living, I think, today in the shadow of a civil rights revolution, which just accomplished so much, but also left so much for us to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, for him also, I, I think there was... Oh, hold on, my printer. Okay. Um, and the, the other thing for him also is that I think, you know, Du Bois, he in a lot of ways is sort of the beginning of kind of a disenchantment with among, you know, progressives or socialists with democracy itself. Um, and the idea that, you know, we, we, we don't we can't have the public. Uh, they, they won't they won't accept our ideas. And so we have to come up with some other way. And, and he most famously, you know, devised this idea of the talented 10th, um, which ultimately I think, you know, I think you could say is, was not a good idea. Like it was, it was a failure. Um, and he realized that to some degree sometimes in his life and other times he, he you know, he just kept coming back to it. I mean, well, he comes up with all it. sorts of different ways to give up on American democracy. Like I mentioned that he dies the night before the March on Washington in 1963. I didn't say that he was in Ghana where he had moved a few years before after joining the Communist Party as a sort of ultimate fuck you to the United States and the American establishment more than anything else. Because not, I think so much because he had turned away from American ideals, but because he'd given up on the possibility of ever seeing them realized. And one way you can tell the story of Du Bois's life is by thinking of all the different ways he had come up with for why there was no way that the United States would ever give him the country that he wanted it to be. So you mentioned the Talented Tenth. Uh, that's an idea that there's the African-American race will be saved by mobilization of its elite. What I think is often, that's well known today. What I think is forgotten is that even in The Souls of Black Folk, an extraordinary book in all sorts of ways, Du Bois's solution for sort of what to do with the problem of Jim Crow his ideal is basically, we will reach out for to make an interracial alliance of the elite. So the talented tenth of Black America will be able to extend a hand to its counterpart in white America. And we will come up with a system that is rational and efficient and that reflects the best of both societies. So that, in a sense, his swing vote at the time, the person he's writing that book for, it's a white liberal southerner like, for instance, Woodrow Wilson, so born, sorry, born in Virginia. Yes, he's a governor of New Jersey, but is the type of person who Du Bois sees as persuadable. And that's striking today, given that Wilson is, I think, remembered nowadays as sort of one of the figures for he resegregates um, the federal workforce. He's a decided friend to the South. 
when he's in power. But in 1912, Du Bois actually endorses him for president because he th he sees him as, yes, like a white man, yes, a child of the South, but as someone who has a fellow product of the American intellectual elite, he can do business with. Now he quickly comes to regret that, but as we can see, the person who will in Souls of Black Folks say, listen, I'm not opposed to all suffrage restrictions. I think it is perfectly fine to have restrictions, at least rhetorically, I'll say, draw it based on draw it based on ignorance, draw it based on criminality, keep the sort of worst of the dregs of society from the polls. That's fine. Just don't have your suffrage discriminations based along racial lines. That is a very sort of progressive type of elitism that even as he struggles with American democracy throughout his life, it never leaves him entirely. So that the person who is quite skeptical about the practice of American democracy in 1903 will 60 years later for a different set of reasons also have a sort of profound skepticism about what the country can accomplish. Yeah, and the other thing also about Du Bois that I think is that it was sort of a that he's sort of a, a forerunner in, in contemporary left-wing politics is that Du Bois, you know, he, he did not have a lot of, he didn't have direct experience with large-scale campaigning. Uh, and, and that's very different when you look at the way that Republican right-wing contemporary politics has, has a, a, arisen and established itself, that from the very beginning, um, this tradition came out of campaigning. It came out of how do we win an election? Whereas with Du Bois, for him and, and the people who, you know, rightfully admired his, his intellect and many accomplishments, they didn't understand that there were lots of facets to politics that he personally didn't get because he had never experienced it. I absolutely agree with that. And to me, a striking difference between Du Bois and my own political hero, Bayard Rustin, who is the person who actually organizes the March on Washington, which has come up multiple times already, is that Rustin was someone who, listen, it's hard to imagine a more marginalized figure in American life than he was. He was a black, gay, ex-communist in Eisenhower's America, but also one of Martin Luther King's chief advisors and one of the great tactical geniuses behind the civil rights movement. He was entirely a creature of organizations. He was someone who's deeply familiar with the civil rights movement on the ground, also the American labor movement. He's also palling around with Michael Harrington and the Democratic Socialists in New York at the time. So he's someone who is immersed in movement culture and drawing on Du Bois's intellectual legacy in key ways, but testing it against and modifying it based on experiences in real world politics in a way that I think you're absolutely right. Du Bois could almost, there is still like always like the the man who wanted to be part of the thinker who wanted to be part of the ivory tower and sort of quivered at getting his hands dirty with real politics someone like rustin was a profound thinker in his own right but someone who believed in engaging with actually existing democracy as well uh, yeah and there i mean and and that that tension you know as um as the civil rights movement moved along it it, it kept coming up over and over that there were, you know, people who, who uh, didn't like uh, that Martin Luther King was, had kind of a pluralistic approach to his activism as well, that, uh, you know, as, as, he, as pe a lot of people know that, you know, he was, when he was killed, he was trying to go to, uh, to boost a, a strike, a worker strike uh, by sanitation workers in, in Tennessee. Um, and there was people who didn't like that, that they thought that he was detracting from the civil rights, uh, you know, for, for black American struggle. And to him, he thought that, well, if you don't expand who you, who you are helping as, as, you know, black civil rights activists, then why should they help you? Why would they? And this is an essential debate that you see unfolding. Among others, uh, you can read uh, Stokely Carmichael, like later Kwame Ture and Charles Hamilton in the book that gives Black Power its name, uh, Black Power, and that coins the term more or less of systemic racism. They say, like, listen, majoritarian politics, they're not critiquing King so much as like, actually they're going after Rustin quite directly. They say that listen, you can do some stuff by working within the Democratic Party, sure, but really what we need to do is like mobilize African Americans as an interest for themselves, the way that Irish Americans, German Americans go down the rest. We're used to interest group organizing in the United States. So what we need to do as African Americans is we'll get our group sorted first, we'll claim our own identity, and then we can reach out from there. So that yes, majoritarian politics, that'll be there eventually, but it's not the first order of business. And then the real contrast ends up with being with someone like Rustin, who says that 
especially in the case of African Americans, like that's not an option. That if you try and play the game like everyone else has, then you're going to end up mobilizing too much of the country against you. And Rustin, in a brilliant article from 1965 called From Protest to Politics, says that in a sense, it's a valedictory for the civil rights movement. It says we've accomplished so much, but guess what? Now the hard thing starts because dismantling Jim Crow as a legal institution in the South, Rustin says, listen, if we want to change the sort of quality of life for most African-Americans, then this legal transformation is only the beginning, that we need a fundamental social and economic reform that can only come about in the United States by mobilizing a mass electoral coalition. And that African-Americans by themselves, we just don't have the numbers to get it done, that we are a minority and we need majority support. So that requires a tight, tight focus on the requirements of coalition politics, which Rustin believes can actually be met, that you can build an alliance essentially grounded in the working class, the multiracial working class, out of a bold series of economic reforms. But according to Rustin, that means being very, very careful about how you deal with issues that could potentially divide that coalition. And as, again, a Black gay ex-communist growing up in the United States, he's quite familiar with, among other things, the potentially explosive character of racial politics if it's handled in uh, in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Well, and 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 that, um, you know, maintaining that, that unified front. Um, that was ultimately why you did, I, I feel like, why you did see a lot of these huge positive changes in the 1960s and 70s, whether it was with uh, civil rights, whether it was with women's rights, whether it was, you know, with a greater ability to have, you know, state your political views, um, radical left political views, like these, these were things that were not um, you know, you, you, you could go to jail for it. And, not, and there were many people who were socialists who went to jail um, just simply for being socialists. They weren't trying to engage in violent revolution or anything. They just got jailed for it. So, uh, but like that, over time though, you know, that, that together coalition that they had built across class, across sex, across race, um, it began fraying once we got into the, the 1970s and um, and, and I mean, let, let, let's talk about that a little bit. Um, some of that was the work of the of the political right beginning to understand the, the power of organizing, uh, but it wasn't entirely that. But let's, I guess, maybe start with the right wing version of that, and then um, then we'll go to the left. Yeah. So one point to note is that the type of, sort of strong class based political organizing that Rustin holds out as ideal. There's a moment in American life when that is a reality, where the electorate is more or less divided along economic lines, and you have a decided majority of working class people behind one party, the Democratic Party. Now, that is the story of the New Deal in 1936, for instance. FDR, when he's running for a re-election, wins an even bigger landslide than in 1936 than when he was the guy who was just not Herbert Hoover uh, campaigning in the sort of worst in the worst part of the Great Depression. So, a profound, profound significant moment in American. History, but also a real departure from the norm. Throughout American history, the standard has been for the two parties. And so it's worth noting just one that we have this two party system that's not standard in world in sort of world history as a whole. It's much more commonplace to have multiple parties running at any given time rather than just many parties rather than just two. So it's weird in the United States that we just have two parties, but those parties have traditionally been divided along lines of religion, ethnicity, culture, you name it, as all it seems at times almost anything except for class. But there is this moment, roughly 1930s into the 1960s, where this class breakdown is a pretty reliable predictor, not universally reliable, but pretty reliable predictor of how you're going to vote. But if 1936 is a high point, that means that almost instantly you see it starting to slip away and that the crisis of that New Deal coalition really becomes undeniable in 1968, the year when just four years after LBJ wins re-election with more than 60% of the vote, Hubert Humphrey is able to bear, his successor is barely able to scrape together 42%. And the rest of it goes to, in the first case, Richard Nixon, but then also George Wallace. So you are suddenly in a new country where the explosive potential, not just of racial politics, but of sort of a broader set of issues that get mobilized. It's partly, mo it's partly economic, it's partly cultural. It's a whole tangle of concerns where race is essential, but not the entirety of the story. That sort of sledgehammer to the New Deal coalition, it's taken by 1968. And then so much of American history since then is a question of, okay, what happens now that 
this old electoral coalition is falling apart and we're not quite sure what's going to replace it. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the people, and I mentioned, you know, that the, the political right also, you know, played, played a, a role in trying to develop organizational um, power. And they did it both at, at the sort of at the mass level, but also at the intellectual level. So it, in the, um, in the intellectual level, you know, you had the development of, of what they called fusionism, um, this idea that uh, you would vote for, you know, reactionary policies for that. There were there were multiple reasons you could vote for them, and they didn't care what your reasons were. In fact, they would give you three different, completely unrelated uh, reasons to support these ideas. And the idea and these three, uh, they called them three legs of the stool, which was, you know, uh, that you wanted to support, uh, oppose the Soviet Union and communism. The other one was for you know sort of religious or cultural uh, reasons, and then and then the third one was that you know you you uh, you didn't want regulation of of from government. You hated regulation, and you wanted to keep as much of your money from taxes as possible. And they didn't really care. Like and and but that what they did what the, this development of fusionism was that it 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 uh, that they sort of used each of these three motivations to sort of educate the other ones to that that I think was the sort of critical insight of, of, of fusionism um, because even though you know your average person probably never heard of fusionism the the ideas the sort of intellectual filtration did come to them over time I mean what, what's your take yeah it's a rare case of an intellectual desiccation so in this case provided by a lot of folks chiefly around national review so Frank Meyer is sort of lays out the concept and Bill Buckley embodies it in a sense that it's a rare case of seeing intellectuals provide that kind of justification for coalition politics in a way that just doesn't come across normally intellectuals tend to be more concerned about theoretical consistency than about providing a kind of messy justification for different groups getting along with each other but yeah, this idea that, all right, what is the justification for a coalition that could include big business, religious conservatives, Southern whites who are hostile to integration and also staunch anti-communists? This is a pretty good, at least we can all agree on this baseline. Although I'd say that that's a justification that could help explain why, for example, if Barry Goldwater could get the Republican presidential nomination in 1964, has a trickier time with someone like George Wallace. Although there will be folks in the National Review Circle who end up saying that, listen, like the Wallace vote is an essential part of any Republican majority. At the time in 1968, someone like Buckley isn't comfortable with the idea of having a George Wallace in his movement. He's much happier with a sort of Goldwaterite perspective. But over the long haul, the Republican Party builds its sometime majority. It's never a proper successor at sort of the scale of FDR's majority, partly because it can never crack into Congress in the same way, at least until 1994. But it built a pretty thumping presidential majority by figuring out a way to get that sort of core Barry Goldwaterite conservatives on board, a big chunk of the George Wallace vote, and a lot of traditional Republicans together in a majority that, so I mentioned 57, about 57% of the vote goes to either Nixon or George Wallace in 1968. By 1972, it's going to be more than 60% of the vote goes just to Richard Nixon. And that's a sign of you've really assimilated, you've brought those George Wallace voters on board in a major way. And then the change that will come with Reagan is that Nixon wins in 72 on a platform that is broadly centrist on economic issues and takes a really hard line on the culture war. What Reagan will do by 1980 is show that a more explicitly conservative economic policy isn't necessarily death at the polls. He's not going to call for the privatization of Social Security, but he's going to be distinctly to the right of where Nixon was on economics. He's going to win in 1980 and it's going to do it in even large, larger numbers in 1984. So that much more than Nixon's victory is a kind of vindication for the conservative movement. Mm hmm. Well, and, um, and then one of the other developments, I think, also that kind of frayed or kind of yeah led to the end of kind of left wing um, class culture. Oh, sorry, race class um, coalition was, in my opinion, the the rise of legal formalism. Um, legal formalism, to me, is is was the death knell of progressive uh, change in America because uh, 
you can see it with the civil rights movement that the civil rights movement was originally uh, designed to be sort of a, a democratic, um, that the goals were democratic, that they wanted people to vote for candidates who would, you know, vote for certain laws or they wanted to, you know, pass certain ballot initiatives, what, you know, whatever it was, like they, they wanted legislative outputs. Um, but what happened is that gradually as the Supreme Court began to rule more in favor of civil rights, the emphasis, the organizational impetus of left-wing politics shifted away from popular support to legalistic support. And this idea of legal formalism, which is that, well, you know, there is a single objective way in which a law could be said to be true and we happen to know what it is. And gosh, by golly, it is lining up exactly with our political beliefs. And, and of course, the, the problem with legal formalism is it's bullshit. It is not a, a coherent legal theory. It's not, a, it's not even a description. And it, it's like completely false in terms of the history of law, that law as a matter of, uh, you know, as a historical phenomenon is never regarded as this sort of fixed you know, mythical thing that, oh, if we just study it hard enough in our classroom, we can, we can know what, what the truth is and we'll all agree, we'll all come together. And it's total nonsense. But that's yeah, it's what... bad as legal theory. It's worse as an account of legal history as in how the law actually works. And it's somehow even worse as a justification for politics. And of course, as you know from reading the book, someone who very strongly agrees with, the, agrees with you on this and wrote most of a book, manu what was meant to be a book about it back when he was in law school is Barack Obama. This, by the way, my favorite research find is sort of this lengthy manuscript that Obama drafted with his like best friend at Harvard Law School, a uh, former economics professor by the name of Robert Fisher. It is a manifesto for transforming American politics that includes as a foundational principle that a turn to the courts exclusively is just never going to give progressives what they want because ultimately judicial victories can't sustain themselves unless they're backed up by political victories because you're not going to get a progressive legal revolution if Republicans are the ones appointing judges. Yeah, yeah, and and it's well, and, and and that's yeah, that was to me one of the I mean, great disappointments of Barack Obama is that so he had this insight that was you know at ninety eight percent of the truth, and but then he completely abandoned it. Like, talk about that a little bit. It's really complicated because I don't know if he would. I so. A fun thing that came out um, after the book was released, I had a piece in the New York Times that discussed this manuscript that he wrote and tried to use it to explain the arc of Obama's career more broadly. And Obama ended up being asked about sort of what he thought about his own career and what this book said, is or what judging his later career by what he said at the beginning. And according to Obama, he's been consistent the entire time. I would push against that, but he sees himself as sticking more or less in the 2020s to the position that he held in the 1990s. And I would say a mark for, con for consistency is that the Obama of 1991, yes, he has this really strong critique of legal liberalism, but he's also someone who puts himself in that Rustin tradition. Uh, the person who's really important, a major influence, is the great, great, great sociologist, William Julius Wilson, who was at the University of Chicago when Obama was in Chicago, writing books on race, class, capitalism, the in politics, intersection of those questions, which are so much of concern for Obama when he's a community organizer who spends his days trying to build, among other things, alliances between working class whites and African Americans in the inner city trying to come up with some sort of solution to the very immediate problems that they're facing. And he leaves community organizing behind, he says, because ultimately he decides that this isn't going to be able to achieve scale the change that I want it to. And by 1991, we can see him saying that the solution for the problems that both Democrats as a political party and African Americans are facing today is a new electoral majority that brings working class voters of all races together, that this has to be the foundation of any lasting change. And that the way to achieve that is going back to that Rustin model for a big program for economic transformation that can bind these groups together based on self-interest and that appeals to morals, appeals to the law. None of that by itself is going to get the job done. It can be useful as a component of the strategy, but it's not the essence of the thing.
And you might think that this is just so different from the Obama that we ended up getting. But when you look at how he campaigns in 2004, the Barack Obama who's saying that there's no red America, no blue America, that's not a dopey celebration of American patriotism. That's a self-conscious effort to take the sting out of polarized culture wars that he says destroy the New Deal coalition and that he wants to bring back. Even in 2008, when his campaign is on the ropes after the revelation of Jeremiah Wright, goddamn America, and all the rest, gives a speech on race in America that after its discussion of racial politics, trying to situate himself above this divide that he draws between Jeremiah Wright on one side and his grandmother at her least racially enlightened on the other, he then moves at the close of the speech to say, and you know who benefits from racial division? Not ordinary people. It's the few at the top who want to divide us so that we stop pursuing our common goals. That economic pivot is right there. And even in 2012, when he's running for re-election, David Axelrod sits him down at one point, according to Axelrod's memoir, and says, listen, I know that there's a broad suite of issues that you care about, ranging from Guantanamo Bay to gay marriage to go down the list. And those are important. But the way that we are going to win election in a tough economic climate is by casting you, Barack Obama, as the champion of the hard of a hardworking middle class who is trying to defend the American dream while a vulture capitalist like Mitt Romney is circling the country with a glint in its eye, that this is the only way you're going to win. And of course, Obama is going to be undeniably a progressive for anyone in 2012, among other times this will be the first occasion when he explicitly endorses gay marriage but that central economic message which you can see him being drawn to at the start of his career is still the thing that is motivating his re-election campaign in 2012. now i do think there's a really profound change in democratic conversation after the election for lots of reasons but it's striking how much continuity there is in the story as well yeah yeah i think that's a good point um yeah rhetorically obama doesn't seem to have changed much, but you know, in terms of his actions, they they seem to have changed. Well, I guess he couldn't enact anything uh, early. Well, that's part of the problem is he can do some stuff after 2012. Mm -hmm. Exactly, he can keep calling for economic transformation and saying that the defining issue of our time is economic inequality. But when he doesn't have a Democratic majority in the House and the Senate, you're not going to get anything done. And mm -hmm. you will have folks like Chuck Schumer by then who is saying, like, listen. For every vote that, this is a famous quote in progressive circles, for every vote that we lose in Pennsylvania coal country, we'll pick up two in the Philadelphia suburbs. And he's saying that Democrat Republicans are gone insane. Democrats can be the party of business now. And as a consequence, a again, sort of tragedy of this period, I think, is that the Obama coalition becomes a stand-in for, among other things, a flight of affluent college-educated voters into the Democratic Party and a continued erosion of that rusting coalition that Obama said he wanted to bring into politics in the first place. And that was responsible for electing him to the presidency twice. And it's so frustrating to see someone who understood that project from the beginning and who was able to bring it together into practice twice sort of lose the plot by the second term so that 2016 ends up playing out the way that it does in good measure because of the flight of those for, in the first case, overwhelmingly white working class voters, but by 2020, an increasingly multiracial struggle with the working class that you see on the Democratic side. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, you know, a lot of that has to do with the fact that um, there, there, there was, um, so while, while he, he, rhetorically he was, you know, approaching this, I think, correctly, at the same time, you had the, uh, a book that was published, which people seem to have only read the title called The Emerging Democratic Majority. Um, and the point of that book wasn't that Democrats will inevitably win forever. It was that there are, you know, uh, certain, you know, there are some demographic groups that are increasing in population. And if Democrats can continue to maintain their current voting coalition, these people naturally coming up will naturally align with their interests. And so Democrats will win. But the Everybody ignored the first point of that book uh, of that book from uh, Rui Teixeira and, and John Judas, which was they have to maintain their current coalition. Yeah, and, you can't go off a cliff with white people who didn't go to college and expect to win durable majorities at the national level. Yeah, yeah, and well, and the the other thing also is that it isn't um, that that is difficult. I think also as as the uh, Democratic Party and the progressive movement in both D.C. and New York of which unfortunately has way overrepresented in, in this country on the left, um, is that 
uh, you know, these two power centers emerged, which were heavily secular, heavily educated, you know, entirely urban. They didn't, uh, they, they lost touch, not just with the white working class, but also with the black working class, the Hispanic working class. And so, so, and, and you're seeing this continual erosion of, of, uh, of minority votes for Democrats since that, since the 2008 Obama election that now, you know, Donald Trump had a record high for, you know, of, of Republican support among black Americans, among Hispanic Americans. He did better than Mitt Romney did better than George W. Bush. Um, and, you know, and, and Asian Americans, there's a, you know, a, a, a subset of them that are coming to think that, you know, maybe the Republicans are right about stuff. And so, but because democratic and progressive politics has sort of become rarefied uh, and credentialized, obsessed, uh, network obsessed, that now they're deliberately creating this, this uh, political culture that focuses entirely on how you, what words you, you're allowed to say and things like that. And, you know, and like the, the right wing argument about cancel culture is complete, you know, completely uh, specious and um, certainly not illustrious. I mean, they love canceling people. I can say that as a former um, c conservative activist, they love canceling people. But at the same time, you know, there is, there is a, a, a granular, a grain, a grain of truth there in that a lot of people, they don't like this continual debate about, well, what, what is appropriate to say at a, you know, at a time when I'm not trying to be offensive to some group or whatever. Yeah. The thing I would add to that, well, so one point is that it's easy to fall into a type of like permanent despair over the state of the Democrats for lots of reasons. But I will say that 2022 is like a good point of optimism in the other direction, where sort of defying historical norms, Democrats, listen, it's not enough of a electoral victory. It's not even a straight up electoral victory in the House. Like, you know, they lost, but they lost by less than one would expect given broader conditions. And one reason why is that the sort of erosion of Democratic support with black and brown working class voters more or less stopped. You know, things didn't get worse. They didn't get drastically better, but they didn't get worse. And a mistake that folks on my side of the debate, I think, too often make is to argue that because we want this working class coalition as a matter of principle and because we think it would be this sort of the best electoral foundation for good policymaking, it's to say that, that this is the only way that Democrats can win. And I think the fact is that Democrats did pretty well in 22 with a message that leaned heavily on sort of non-material questions like for example the state of democracy you know this is obviously important issues but it's not the type of sort of meat and potato uh, question that you would expect from a certain type of old school leftist advising democrats on what to do next and so that's just one point to say that it's easy to we shouldn't be deterministic about this there's room for given any given election but i also want to say that What's striking to me digging into the history of this is that the transformation that you're talking about, sort of the growing importance of a sort of college educated activist elite and how politics sort of warps itself to fit the concerns of that group at the expense of lots of other folks, that this is a very old point in American politics, oh, going back almost to the 1960s, so that you see a lot of political scientists talking about Barry Goldwater supporters and George McGovern supporters as the first instance of this. It's like, ah, the ideologues have entered in a major way and they're losing track with the public at large. And I think there's a lot to be said for this, but it's useful to remember and maybe inspiring in a way that the points we're making now, we are not the first generation to discover them. We might be the first to be able to do something in a serious way and change the course, but this is a critique that has been around for quite a bit. Uh, yeah, yeah. And as the, I mean, and, and when you look at the way that the political right handles this, this dynamic. So, you know, as I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, the development of, of fusionism, that was sort of like the, the intellectual uh, foundation for what they were doing. But then they also focused on the, the uh, grassroots level, which was to build up organizing within churches and radicalize, you know, right-wing pastors uh, or, you know, just non-political theological conservatives um, and fundamentalists that, you know, that they got people, and, and, you know, and, and they invested in media, populist media that, uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize like these, these channels like TBN or, um, you know, uh, um, you know, various, you um, web websites like daily wire or whatever like you can say yeah those are dumb the people who watch them are dumb but you know what a lot of people watch them and 
it's it's really fascinating that as a you know ostensible a political movement that styles itself as the party of the people has no makes no attempt to have popular media. It's really weird. We want to. It's just very hard. And one excuse, which is, it is an excuse, but it's not entirely valid, is that it is a lot easier when there are rich people who are willing to give you money to fund your experiment, and that there are some some of these enterprises are doing quite well for themselves on a sort of just pure balance and loss profit statement. Uh, ben Shapiro bank accounts doing okay. But there is an, as you know, there's this entire institutional framework of sort of conservative organizing in DC, especially where these are people who have never had to be responsible for raising their own cash, for, rather for making their living in a free market. They're just subsidized by a donor class that likes the ideas that they're putting forward. Uh, and I will say that an important point to remember about 2016, one of the reasons why Trump wins, well, he takes on a lot of the key convic convictions of that old conservative establishment, what some on the right call conservatism, Inc., which was fine to just run their version of the Reagan playbook again and again and again. And a key move that Trump makes, like how do you win over white working class voters? Well, one way is by explicitly breaking with a type of Paul Ryan agenda that says that entitlement reform, cutting Social Security and Medicare, this should be a central priority for the Republican Party. Trump says, of course not. No, we're going to defend these institutions. We're going to repeal Obamacare, sure, but we're also going to give you better health care. Everyone's going to get everything that they want. And that's laughable as policy, as it turns out, but at least as broadly orienting the principles of the Republican Party in line with a coalition that had already become increasingly blue collar anyway, it was turned out to be a really savvy electoral move in a way that I and many others on the left didn't see, didn't appreciate the significance of at the time. Yeah, well, and he's resurrecting that again with uh, Ron DeSantis right now, and uh, attacking, correctly pointing out that DeSantis, you know, wanted to partially privatize Medicare and, and wanted to raise the retirement age, et cetera. I mean, these are these are effective um, techniques and, and the conventional Republican professional class really is powerless against them. Yeah, and the thing is, if you go back to the 1960s, Kevin Phillips, a Richard Nixon aide who writes the book, The Republican, uh, The Emerging Republican Majority, which outlines this plan for bringing George Wallace voters into the Republican Party, he says explicitly that free market economics is not by, is not going to get you there, that it needs to be a kind of culturally conservative New Deal is what he envisions as sort of the appropriate policy framework for this new Republican coalition. And there's a sense in which the victory of the conservative movement with Reagan, it's a it can be a policy win in lots of respects, but it I think slows the creation of a conservative majority in line with what Phillips envisioned, precisely because it commits them to an economic program that's so at odds with the quite obvious material interests of the people they're trying to appeal to. And you see, so one reason why Democrats are and liberals are talking about Reagan Democrats in the 1980s is this idea: yes, they like Reagan personally; they're not fans of what the Democratic Party is today, but they haven't full bore converted to the other side, partly because they see Republicans as still, at the end of the day, the party of business. And a question now in our sort of very messy political climate today is, is there a party of working people? Is there a party of different, uh, is there a party of business? You know, Democrats will say they're the party of working people. Some Republicans will, uh, will at the same time. And this is, it's confusing, it's complicating, but I think that this is also a moment of opportunity for progressives who want to do something to reverse a tide that's been running against ordinary Americans for so many decades. Yeah, well, and, you know, it's it's there. There's an issue, though, fundamentally. I think between that, uh, a lot of progressives, you know, they, they are aware of polling showing that the public agrees with their issue positions, uh, and so they think that that's all that you have to do. Like the, the, the all you have to do is say, "Well, I want this stuff," and you want it too. So, pro, you know. Victory. And if you yes. don't agree with me, then you're a dumb dumb who's voting against your own interests and you deserve what's coming to you. You know, that's the worst version yeah. of the response. Yeah. And like, and, and, and neither one, yeah, this, it doesn't, it's not persuasive. It doesn't, well, not persuasive, not only not persuasive, it's also not motivating because mm -hmm. I think, you know, for among the successful people that you talk about in the book is that they made people feel like they were getting something more than just some policies, that they were part of something, part of something, that there was a, a movement, that there was, you know, uh, that they were, that they were being part of something bigger than themselves. And, mm -hmm. you know, as for, for, if you're a progressive activist, you kind of feel that way, you know, for yourself, 
But you have to understand that the general public isn't ideological in any any real shape or form. And, and to that point, um, I, one of the quotes you uh, use in the book is uh, from uh, Eugene Debs, who was a socialist uh, uh, politician in, in the early 20th century. And he was in jail when he wrote this statement. He was in prison, um, and uh, but he was running for president uh, from, from prison. And uh, he, he wrote the following as sort of his last um, presidential campaign material that he was allowed by the censors of the government to send to the public. And, he, and what he said was, I hope for everything and expect nothing. The people can have anything they want. The trouble is they do not want anything. At least they vote that way on election day. I think that's such a powerful, uh, you know, sort of distillation of the dilemma that people who want progressive change uh, face. Um, I mean, what, 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 what's your response to that? And it's true. And it makes eminent sense if you're Du Bois coming to the end of, I believe it's his fourth presidential campaign at the time after decades working in this cause. I mean, Debs, feeling like, Debs. Sorry, yeah. sorry, Debs. Um, it's feeling like that the sort of destination is farther away than ever. But with the longer perspective of history, we know that barely 10 years later, this is going to be the high point of that New Deal moment. It's not going to change everything, but it's going to be a transformation for working people, the type that Debs gave his life to advance their sort of the interest of working people the type that gave Debs gave his life to advancing and that so much of politics in avoiding the despair that we talked about with Du Bois and I think that anyone who follows this stuff can fall into is being aware in a sense knowing the scale of the challenge that you're facing prepares you to avoid giving up because you're not expecting transformation right away you know that it's all going to be hard and that every victory will be partial. It can always be reversed. And that with the best of intentions, you can end up in a place that you did not want to go, but that there is all sorts of signs of things changing better, changing for the better over time. And that despair is always so tempting, but it does no one any good. And that at the end of the day, for those of us on the left, we have to believe in our country enough to think that it could actually be saved. Otherwise, what is the point of this? So it requires a kind of baseline, baseline faith in other people, partly because we are, at least I think of myself as committed to a movement whose purpose is to take money and power from the very small number of people who have a lot of it and distribute it more fairly to the rest of society. And that reflects a faith that people, when you give them decent choices, will not always, but enough of the time, be able to come over to your side. And there's so many reasons to despair, but in the long perspective of American history, I find a lot of reason to hope as well. Yeah, well, and, and ultimately, I think coming to the realization that, you know, that that, that, that famous um, quote from uh, Martin Luther King about, you know, the, the, the moral arc of the universe ends toward justice. King himself did not believe that. Um, that he he used it as a rhetorical point to inspire people and to understand that you know if you want to build change you need to understand that the moral arc of the universe bends toward those who bend it mm -hmm. uh, and that that's ultimately um that you know change is hard and understanding that you will fail but you will definitely fail if you don't try Yes, and acknowledging there are all sorts of ways to change the world that don't involve working through electoral politics. You could go through culture, for instance. You could go through commerce. There are all sorts of different ways to make a difference. But I do think that if your goal is a type of broad scale structural transformation, that electoral politics is the best bet we have. It might not work. We have to be candid about this. But of the deeply imperfect choices facing us today, this is the best one that we have. Yeah. All right. Well, let's maybe uh, wrap with kind of a discussion of, of the idea of popularism. Um, so this this is a kind of a in, in, in very intra left inside baseball uh, topic. But basically, there is now a debate between people who say that, well, you know, I want to have progressive social change, but the public isn't there for it right now. So we just, you know, we need to what we have to do is get elected first. And then we can 
push these other things. And, and then there's other people that say, no, we have to, we have to push for the right changes first because you guys kept saying you're going to get elected and then none of these things ever happen. Um, I mean, what, what's the, is this, is this a debate that politicians are having or only primarily uh, writers and podcasters? It's something, no, I think it's something that within democratic circles, questions of how to win elections are taken very seriously. But I would say that I think that there is a smart version of popularism that is sort of motivated by people who, driven by people who I think are acting in good faith. And then there's a kind of incoherent one where popularism just turns into, I would like to have policies that play well in my New Jersey suburban district that I want to have reelect me to Congress, which means cut taxes for blue states. Let's get on board with that. And I think a consistent version of popularism actually fits with a kind of left politics that does take a really bold position on economic issues, or at least could be brought around to that perspective. The one point where I probably diverge from populism in a major way is, or at least some versions of it, is the assumption that public opinion is static, or at least I would say that when obviously I care about winning elections, I wrote a book where this is the driving theme, but I think we have to be aware that the bounds of public opinion are always changing and that it's easy to assume that things are fixed and static when in fact there's a lot of flux. When I teach uh, to my students at GW, I point out among other things, just the transformation in the sort of approval for gay marriage, for instance, already come up a couple of times in our conversation today from an issue that George W. Bush runs in 2004 on a Republican party platform that's promising a constitutional amendment to ban gay marriage, jump ahead to today when a non-zero number of Republicans in the Senate will vote in basically in favor of a bill for gay marriage enough to get it past the filibuster hurdle in a deeply, deeply polarized country. That is an extraordinary transformation. Or again, when Barack Obama in 2008, not going to touch that issue, too worried about bringing the Democratic coalition, just four years later, goes to endorse it. And that, I think it shows the capacity for an evolution in public opinion that reflects itself in politics necessarily, but isn't always driven by politics, right? That is one of those cases where it's so much a story about changes in the broader culture, ultimately dragging politicians along with them. So that I think that the really important thing to keep in mind is just, what are we looking for from our politics at any given time? Because the one area I think that we have to, the point I have to recall is that it is so hard to get everything you want simultaneously. And spending looking at the long sweep of American history, I just didn't find any case where, from a progressive perspective, you're able to do everything everywhere all at once, to coin a phrase, but that if you are strategic, you can pick the cases that will make the most difference for the greatest number of people. And that's something that it is not revolution tomorrow, but it is a transformation in daily life that can make the world a more just place. And to me, that is worth the effort. All right. Yeah, I agree. That's, a, I think, a great place to end it here. Um, let me put the book up on the screen. So uh, we've been talking today with Timothy Shank. He is the author of Realigners, Partisan Hacks, Political Visionaries, and the Struggle to Rule American Democracy. And uh, you're also on Twitter as well. Let's put that up on the screen for those who are watching. And if you're listening, um, that's uh, Tim underscore Shank, S-H-E-N-K. Um, so thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. It was a blast. So that's the program for today. I appreciate everybody watching or listening. And I encourage everybody to go to theoryofchange.show where you can get more episodes with video and audio and transcripts. And if you have a subscription, um, you can get full access to every episode. Some of the episodes are available only, um, uh, some of the episodes are only available in full to subscribers. So if you want to become a subscriber, I encourage you to do that. Go to patreon.com slash discover flux. Um, or if you are somebody who prefers Substack, you can go to theoryofchange.show and we have a Substack sign up form right on there so you can subscribe that way. And I do appreciate everybody who is supporting the show. You make it possible we're not being subsidized by nonprofits or universities or billionaires. No, we're being subsidized by people like you. You make this show possible and we really need your help to keep it going and to make this a sustainable enterprise. These deep conversations about politics and religion and social change, they're not ones that the you know that you're gonna see on cable news. They're not ones that you're gonna see uh, 
in a lot of places that are just about entertaining and infotainment. So uh, we really do need your support to keep doing this. And please do uh, spread the word. Like we need more people to be watching and uh, listening. So if you are not able to subscribe, I would definitely encourage you to leave us a great review on iTunes. Um, those are very helpful. They help people uh, become aware of the show and uh, let others know that we're doing a good job. So I really do appreciate everybody for that. And I will see you next time.